So our speaker tonight is my dear friend, Dr. Christy Reel. When Christy was a teenager living in New Orleans, she took ornithology at Tulane, and that was at the same time that I was teaching the lab there. Uh, Tom and I had met her before that and had done some birding with her, uh, but it was really fun to, to have her in the ornithology class. Uh, after she, she received a Bachelor of Arts degree at Harvard in biology, then she went on to Princeton and was uh, received her PhD there from the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology. And her postgraduate work included a postdoc research fellow with the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute in Panama, or STRI, and that's, that's around the canal zone. And then she was also a junior fellow in the Harvard Society of Fellows. Uh, Christy's now an assistant professor in the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology at Princeton University. And she recently received tenure. Congratulations, Christy, that's really well deserved. Uh, in my opinion, Christy is a superhuman. She's a professor. She mentors tons of students, graduate and undergraduate. She does field research in Panama and gives invited lectures all over the world. Her, prov her provocative publications are often highlighted in some really top-notch scientific journals. Uh, she is a devoted mother to Desi and a wife to Andres. And she somehow manages to find time for birding and playing cello and contra dancing. Uh, so tonight, Christy will tell us about her long-term study of greater Anis in Panama and provide some insights into the species' cooperative behaviors. So with that, folks, I give you New Orleans' own Christy Reel. <laughs> Thanks, Jen. <laughs> yeah, I've been uh, birding with many of you for a very long time. I know there are some people on the Zoom call that I ha probably haven't seen since I was in high school, but I remember all of you and all those birding experiences really left an impression on me and it's why I'm doing what I'm doing today. So it's such an honor to be able to talk to this group. Um, so uh, what, I, what I'm gonna do tonight is talk a little bit about this species. This is the greater Ani uh, and it's a communal breeder. Um, it's a tropical bird and uh, it's one I've worked on really since I started graduate school, which was long time ago now, more than 15 years ago. Um, and when most, most birders don't go to the tropics to see Anis. You know, when you look at this bird, it's a black bird. Most birders don't even know Anis are cuckoos. They think that they're blackbirds in the, in the Icterid family. Um, but Anis have this incredibly rich hidden social life. They're communal nesters. They nest in groups where several unrelated pairs share parental care to a mixed clutch of young. It's a really unusual communal breeding system. And so what I wanna do in this talk is tell you a little bit about that research and some of the things we've discovered about greater Anis, but also to put it in the context of the diversity of mating and parental care strategies in the cuckoo family, because cuckoos are actually incredibly diverse in their breeding um, systems. There are brood parasitic species, there are cooperative species like the Anis, um, there are species with reverse sexual dimorphism and male-only parental care. So I wanna talk a little bit first about just why cuckoos have this incredible diversity of breeding behaviors, give you a little bit of uh, a tour through the, the, the cuckoo family, um, and then zo zoom in for a little bit on greater Anis and um, what I've discovered about their cool social lives. Um, so let's see. How can I advance this? Hmm, not going to the next slide. Let's see, oh, there we go. Okay, um, so uh, if you're a Louisiana birder, this is probably the Ani species you're familiar with. Um, this is the groove build Ani. They're in the same genus as the greater Ani, uh, the genus Crotophaga, and that means tick eater. Uh, they're named that because of their association with open habitats and pastures and fields and cattle, even though they don't actually eat ticks. Um, but especially the groove and smooth build Anis are often seen around cattle, so they were called tick eaters. Um, so the, the group build Ani is a more northerly distribution than the greater Ani. Um, it ranges through Central America and Mexico and into the southern United States, but it shares a similar communal breeding system with the greater Ani. In fact, all four species in this group 
um, the three species in the genus Crotophaga and one closely related species, they all share this communal breeding habit. Um, they're all highly social. So this is a fantastic photo of smooth-billed Anis being very cuddly with each other in their breeding groups. Um, and all of the Anis are really more like primates in their social lives. They're more like little monkeys than they are like birds because they stay in these groups for years. Sometimes their whole lives are spent with the same social partners. And they're not related to these other group members. They're, they're not extended families. They're mostly composed of different pairs that come together as adults, form these breeding groups, um, and have several different reproductive adults in the same group, which is very unusual in birds. Uh, most of the time when groups breed together, it's a breeding pair and non-breeding helpers um, that help to raise the young. But the Anis are truly communal in the sense that there are many reproductive pairs in the same group. Um, this is the fourth species in that um, group, this, this lineage of cuckoos. The, these are Guira cuckoos, and Guira cuckoos look very different from the Anis. They look more like you would imagine a real cuckoo to look like. They look a lot like the striped cuckoos of South America. Um, but the Guira cuckoos are basically just Anis in disguise. Their social lives and their communal nesting and their breeding habits are essentially identical to the Anis. Um, so what is a communal nester? Um, communal nesters are birds where more than one female lays her eggs in the same nest um, and provides parental care to it. So birds that are not parasitic, but actually provide parental care in a shared way. Um, this is a somewhat blurry photograph of four greater Anis. This is a breeding group um, and males and females look the same. So what you're seeing in this photo is two breeding pairs, um, two males and two females. And even though they have a social pair bond with their mate, so the male and female of each pair um, spend a lot of time together, they also have social bonds with the other group members. So they recognize their other group members. They don't allow extra group birds near their nest. Um, and they can tell uh, birds that they've nested with in the past. They, they know the social histories of their group members and of birds in other breeding groups. Um, and when I say they're truly communal, what I mean is that they build a single nest together and all of the females in the breeding group put their eggs in the same nest. They literally put all their eggs in the same basket. This is a photograph of a greater Ani nest from my field site in Panama that has 10 eggs in it that were laid by three different unrelated females. And they tend to contribute about the same number of eggs to the nest per female. So a group with two females each female usually lays three or four eggs, and so you have a total clutch of six or eight eggs. With three females, it's something like 12, sometimes as many as 15 eggs in the same nest, and very rarely um, you might get a group with four breeding females. Um, and this is incredibly unusual in birds. And the reason for that, as I'll talk about in a little bit, is that it's really hard to increase clutch size by that much without incurring some pretty severe costs of competition, both between the females who are laying in these nests as well as the young that are being raised in this nest. It's hard to double clutch size and not, um, not have any uh, decrease in survival of the nestlings. Um, it's hard to incubate all those eggs. It's hard to feed all those mouths. Um, so in greater Anis, when you watch a nesting group, um, what you'll see is that different breeding pairs in the group often take turns in the nest. So this is a photograph from uh, a nest camera from one of our field um, in, in Panama, one of our nests in Panama, where a female is sitting on the nest and she has a green leaf in her bill that her male mate has just brought to her and she's gonna put it in the nest. And so you'll often see like one pair working on the nest for a bit and then they might fly off and another pair will come take their place. Um, and occasionally all the pairs in the groups will meet at the nest and they'll often perform this communal calling display where they all get together and call, almost like wolves howling in a pack together to sort of reinforce, you know, okay, here we are, we're the breeding group. We're all at the nest together right now. Um, I, unfortunately, I can't show you video of that, but I'll show you some pictures later on. Um, and so uh, as you might've seen when I showed you that picture of the net of the eggs, um, all the eggs look pretty similar. Uh, they all lay eggs that are unmarked. They don't have any kind of distinctive patterning to them or spots or anything like that. So females can't recognize their own eggs. Um, and when the chicks hatch, they can't recognize their own chicks either. So when the offspring hatch, like in this nest, all of the birds in the group provide care to the young. They all deliver food to the nestlings 
indiscriminately. So they're not preferentially feeding their own babies within the nest. They're really feeding just whoever whoever's mouth pops up. And I've even done some cross fostering experiments of switching broods between nests to show that the adults can't recognize who they're feeding or who's related to whom. Um, and so in this photo, um, which is from a motion activated nest camera, uh, you can see the nestlings in the middle of the nest here reaching up to get the food from their parents and all four birds in this breeding group have sort of coincidentally arrived at the nest at the same time. And what they're giving the babies are big insects. So greater Anis are large insect specialists. They eat mostly orthopterans, like 90% of what they feed to the nestlings are crickets and grasshoppers and katydids. Um, they also eat cicadas and roaches, uh, big spiders, um, and sometimes small vertebrates like um, geckos and baby iguanas and things like that. Um, so when the nestlings grow up, they have a really, really rapid growth, really fast incubation, really rapid growth. When the nestlings are ready to leave the nest, these guys are about three weeks old, um, they have a few options. Um, almost all of the nestlings stay with their group for a full year. So they don't disperse right away. They stay with their group for the full year. So after the breeding season, you'll see the, the whole group stays together on the territory, all the breeding adults as well as whatever fledglings they managed to raise the previous year. Um, and then in the next breeding season, most of those young birds leave. They disperse, um, they leave their natal group um, and they don't breed right away. They don't breed until they're two or three years old. Um, so most of them are do what's called floating. They move around the population, they hang out with other young birds, um, and they wait to breed for a few years. So some of them disperse and float. Some of them stay with their natal group, and they help to raise the next year's brood of young. They don't breed themselves, and they don't have a, a, a social mate. They're not paired off, um, but they do what's called helping. They're non-breeding helpers, and they help to raise their, their, their natal group's uh, brood of offspring the next year. And some of them disperse to other groups, not their natal group, but to, to completely different groups within the study area. And they do the same thing. They act as helpers. They feed the young of that group, but they don't actually breed themselves. Um, so when you think about ways of being an Ani, they have a lot of different options. Um, if you're a breeding adult, so you're three years or older, most of them find a social mate and then they join with another pair to form a two-pair group. And that's the most common group size in the population. Something like 70% of groups in our study population are two breeding pairs. Um, but the remaining 20 to 30% uh, are groups that contain three pairs. Um, and so in theory, a three-pair group could form when three pairs spontaneously come together and decide to build a, a nest together. But usually what happens is that these three pair groups form when there's already a two pair group on a territory and a third pair joins them. So about 20% of these groups also have a related help, uh, a young bird from the natal group from the previous year that stayed with its parents and with its um, uh, other adult uh, that raised it, its allo parents for a year. Um, and then again, some of them have these unrelated helpers that are young birds that disperse from other groups. Um, sometimes these unrelated helpers are also adults that have like lost their social mate. Maybe their social mate got killed by a predator or their reproductive attempt, their breeding attempt failed. And so they abandon their group and they decide to join another group even though they don't have a social mate yet. So there's lots of different um, birds doing different things in these groups. Um, and finally, there's another way that Anis can breed, which is to practice a sneaky reproductive strategy known as parasitism. So some females essentially lay their eggs in the nests of other groups, but they don't provide parental care. They don't stay with the social group. They aren't recognized as group members by that group. They dump their eggs in the nest and then they leave again. Um, and so much of my research in Panama has been devoted to trying to figure out what's going on here, right? Like why is this, why did this complex social system evolve? What are the costs and benefits of being in these groups? Um, and what are some of the, the consequences of this social life for things like communication and cognition? How do these birds learn to recognize each other in groups? How do they learn um, each other's vocalizations? How do they learn each other's appearances? Um, and how do they navigate the 
um, inherent conflicts in any social group, which is that you're cooperating with the same individuals that you're very closely competing with. You're younger in the same nest competing for resources, you're competing for resources with these other adults in the group. And so how the Anis um, sort of find this fine line between cooperation and conflict is really at the heart of my research. So um, I'll, I'll, I'll return to Anis in a little bit and I'll tell you some more about our work in Panama and some of the things we've discovered soon. But first I wanted to take a brief detour because uh, people usually ask me when I tell them about this crazy breeding system and I tell them about Anis, um, people always say, this seems so bizarre. You know, like what other birds breed like this? Uh, this strange communal nesting. Um, because most people have only ever heard of breeds, birds that breed as pairs. So things like Mississippi kites or swallowtailed kites or mockingbirds or cardinals or, you know, 99% of the birds that you see on a regular basis breed as pairs and both male and female provide care to the young. Um, and there's usually not a lot um, of cooperation or cooperative breeding with other individuals. But cuckoos are a bit odd because um, if you, you know, Ani seem really strange, but if you look across the cuckoo family, um, bizarre reproductive behaviors are basically par for the course for cuckoos. Um, it's a really big family. There are about 140 species in something like 38 genera, and they're found worldwide. Cuckoos are in all parts of the globe except at the poles. And they're a really ancient family, um, and there's a lot of controversy about what their closest relatives are, but there's a pretty good consensus that within the cuckoos, there are five main lineages or groups of species. They're called subfamilies, but that's kind of arbitrary. Um, five main subfamilies within the cuckoos. Um, Anis are one of them down here on the bottom. And the closest relatives of the Anis, this is sort of a, a family tree of the cuckoos and, and these five subfamilies. Um, Anis are most closely related to the other New World ground cuckoos, things like roadrunners and um, the wonderful ground cuckoos of um, Central and South America, which are the birds that birders go to the tropics for, not the Anis. Um, and so those, those two lineages are basically confined to the New World. They're only found in the Neotropics. Um, there's another branch up here that contains the Kuas, which are endemic to Madagascar, and the Kukals, which are mostly African. Um, and then there's this largest subfamily, a big group um, uh, that contains most of the old, old World Cuckoos, a bunch of species in um, Australia, Eurasia, um, and Africa. And it also contains the um, arboreal New World cuckoos, so not the ground cuckoos, but the ones that live in trees, including our own yellow-billed and black-billed cuckoos. Um, and the reason that I've put this sort of family tree of cuckoos out is that if you look across this, um, if you look across this family tree, they basically run the table on strategies for how to raise young. Um, so if you Oh yeah, I was gonna say this is uh, I forgot about this. This is a uh, this is a really cool uh, image of a fossil that I found the other day. I've never seen this before. This is um, one of the earliest known cuckoo species. Um, this is from the late Eocene, which is like 35 million years ago. Um, the cuckoos are so ancient. Um, even the the clade containing the Anis, the group of uh, the group containing the Anis and the Gira cuckoo is like 16 million years old. So they're really an ancient group of birds. Um, and this fossil was found in, in Colorado. And one of the things I think is cool about it is that it actually doesn't have a head. You can't see the head of this bird, but you can see the feet. And one of the things you can see on the feet is that it has two toes pointing forward and two toes pointing backwards, which is one of the features that unites all of the cuckoos. Despite their really diverse breeding habits, they have certain anatomical and physiological characteristics in common. And those strange toes are one of them. Um, but uh, if to go back to this, this cuckoo family tree, like I was saying, they really run the table on the diversity of reproductive strategies. So um, in the US, you know, we're, we're most familiar with the yellow-billed and black-billed cuckoos, which nest as pairs. Um, but even these have some um, shared ancestry with a lineage of parasitic cuckoos. And these two species, even though they mostly build their own nests and provide parental care to their own young, they're also facultative brood parasites. So it, that's extremely rare. So yellow-billed and black-billed cuckoos sometimes parasitize nests of other species. Um, and this is a photograph I found of a hooded warbler nest. This was taken in Pennsylvania just a couple years ago. This is a hooded warbler nest with two hooded warbler eggs and one cuckoo egg. 
Um, and the people who found this nest were not sure whether it was a black-billed cuckoo or a yellow-billed cuckoo egg because the eggs are so similar. But it's clearly one of those two species that has parasitized this hooded warbler nest. Um, of course, the most famous brood parasitic cuckoos are the European species like the common cuckoo. Um, and this has been really well studied. Um, the, the details of this breeding system have been beautifully worked out in Europe. Um, female common cuckoos don't build their own nests. They parasitize other species, mostly much smaller bodied species like warblers um, and finches. Um, and this photograph is showing a female common cuckoo removing the egg of a reed warbler from the nest. She'll lay her own egg in its place. And you can see which of these eggs is the cuckoo egg. It's this one down here on the lower right that's just a little bit larger than the reed warbler egg. Um, and cuckoos lay mimetic eggs, so the pattern, if not the size, matches the host species really beautifully. Um, different species of hosts are parasitized by different individual common cuckoos. So the top row here shows eggs laid by different female common cuckoos. It's all the same species, um, but different females lay eggs with different patterns, and each female parasitizes a different host species. Um, the different host species are on the bottom. You can see they, they match pretty well, except for this one blue one. This one blue host species is a, a, a dunnock, I think, and that's the only one that common cuckoos can't really mimic. They don't seem to be able to get the solid blue egg, but all these other patterned eggs, um, they, they mimic really beautifully. Um, when the parasitic species, when the baby cuckoo hatches, it ejects the egg of the host out. So this is um, a baby cuckoo that's hatched. Its head is pointing down in the nest. And what it's doing here is it's rolling the egg of the, the hapless reed warbler out of the nest on its back. Um, and so the brood parasites are, are like cowbirds, right? They're, um, they wind up being fed by these poor, hardworking, smaller bodied hosts. And the really ironic thing about the cuckoo parasites is that this one species, the common cuckoo, has been studied almost to exhaustion because it's the only species that lives in Europe where biologists live. But um, there are about 50 other species of obligate brood parasites in the cuckoos that are much less well known. Um, there are many species in Australia, including the bronze cuckoos, the drongo cuckoos. There's a whole group of brood parasitic cuckoos in Australia and in Asia that are um, very poorly studied. Um, this is a kua. This is the crested kua of Madagascar, and the kuas are really beautiful. They're lovely. They, they look a lot like taracos. They've got these beautiful blue and peach shades, um, and as parental care goes, they're pretty boring. They nest in pairs, and both the male and female provide care to the offspring, so they're not parasitic. They're not cooperative or anything like that, um, but if you go to Africa and see the kukals, the kukals are polygynous, which means that one female mates with several different males, and only the males provide parental care. So the female sings to attract male mates. She will mate with a male, lay her eggs in a nest, and then leave the male to provide the parental care. So they have a reverse sexual dimorphism where the females are much larger than the males. So sort of similar to raptors where the female is the larger sex. But in this case, the reverse sexual dimorphism also goes with role reversal in parental care where the males do all the parental care. The sex ratios in these populations are also really male biased, which is really interesting. There are very few females per male in the population. Um, and then finally, the last lineage of cuckoos, the, the subfamily that's most closely related to the Anis, um, are the ground cuckoos of um, the neotropics. Um, this is a, a rufous vented ground cuckoo. I think this picture, this picture was taken in, in Costa Rica. Um, I think uh, the next picture, which is a pheasant cuckoo, is in the same lineage. I think this picture was taken at Canopy Camp in Panama, where I know some of you have been. Um, and pheasant cuckoos, surprise, surprise, pheasant cuckoos are actually brood parasites. So they're in the same lineage as the ground cuckoos and the roadrunners, but they have independently evolved obligate brood parasitism. So it's a different origin of brood parasitism within the same um, family in the, in the cuckoos. Um, and pheasant cuckoos and striped cuckoos and pavonine cuckoos are all obligate brood parasites in, um, in South America. And what's even cooler is that the striped cuckoo has also independently um, evolved mimetic eggs. So this is um, a range map showing striped cuckoos, which range from Central America down into South America. 
And in Central America, they mostly parasitize rufous and white wrens, which lay blue eggs, and the striped cuckoos lay blue eggs. Um, and in South America, they mostly, they've parasitized a bunch of hosts in South America, um, lots of thorn birds um, and different, um, different small, small bodied species, but they all lay white eggs. And so striped cuckoos in South America lay white eggs. This is one of the, one of the other species I've worked on uh, in Colombia. Um, so the reason why I'm giving you this tour through the cuckoos is to show you that although Anis are the only communal nester in this group, they share a lot of features, both behavioral features and reproductive features, physiological features with these other species. And I don't think it's a coincidence that cuckoos have evolved such a diversity of parental care patterns because they share a set of characteristics um, that sort of predispose them to these different parental care patterns from polygyny with male only parental care to brood parasitism to communal nesting. Um, so those features include um, male biased incubation, including male nocturnal incubation. So in all the cuckoos, in all 140 something species of cuckoos, um, males do a lot of incubation and males always incubate at night, um, which is pretty unusual in birds. Um, and that is something that's probably ancestral in cuckoos. It's probably a trait that evolved at the beginning of the diversification of the cuckoo family and was retained in all these different groups. Um, and male parental care and male incubation is associated with the evolution of both brood parasitism and communal nesting. The idea being that if males are taking care of the young, that frees the females to go and lay their eggs in other places. It could be to go and lay their eggs in another bird's nest, as in parasitism. It could be to lay um, an egg in another, in a female of the same species, like in communal nesting, or it could be to mate with a different male and start a second clutch, as in the polygynous species. Um, so the, the male bias parental care and male incubation is something that's really associated with these different reproductive strategies by females. Another thing the cuckoos share is really fast incubation times and really fast nestling development. Uh, that's true of the Anis, but it's also true of all the other species, even the yellow-billed cuckoos and the roadrunners. Um, Anis have an egg the size of a golf ball. They have like a 35 gram egg and it only takes 11 or 12 days to hatch, which is like the same amount of time that it takes like a warbler egg to hatch. It's like an incredibly fast incubation period. Um, and the nestlings grow really fast too. And again, this is probably an ancestral trait in the cuckoos. Um, it might have evolved for reasons completely unconnected with these different breeding strategies. It might have evolved to avoid predators or, you know, something like that. But it's also one of these characteristics that sort of predisposes towards these different strategies. For example, having a very short incubation period means that the brood parasitic cuckoos can lay their eggs in nests of host species and then their eggs hatch before the host young do, which is clearly a, a advantageous if you're a brood parasite. Um, so, um, the, that kind of gets us back to the Anis, um, where they have retained many of these features, things like um, rapid development and um, male biased incubation and male nocturnal incubation. Um, but in this case, rather than parasitizing other host species, the Anis really parasitize each other. They essentially lay their eggs in each other's nest and then stay and provide parental care. Um, one of the old papers I read on Anis called them um, parasites that have become specialists on themselves, <laughs> which I thought was a really funny way of putting it. But it's really true in the sense that, um, that in many ways they act like brood parasites and even they've retained some of this parasitic behavior, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, so in the, in the Ani groups, um, like I said before, pairs share a, a, a social bond. So you'll see pairs preening each other and sticking together closely within the group, but they also share these social bonds with their other group members. Um, females in these groups in particular have to coordinate their reproduction. They have to coordinate the timing of their egg laying very closely. And so they, they hang out a lot in groups at the nest, particularly when they're building the nest and when they're getting ready to lay the eggs. Um, I started working on Greater Anis in 2006 when I was uh, just starting graduate school, and I went to Barrow, Colorado Island in Panama um, because my advisor was working there, and I did not know what I was going to work on, um, but I was really lucky that I was a birder, and I had been trained by the best, by Tom and Jen, to notice what was around me and to pay attention to, to it and to look for bird's nests, and I started finding greater ani nests when I was there, and I thought, well, this would be a great topic for a PhD. 
Um, and what this uh, map is showing is Barrow, Colorado Island here in the middle. Um, the Panama Canal is over here to the right. Uh, this is the railroad over here in the upper right. Um, and these are, these are container ships going through the canal. And each of these red dots is indicating the location of a communal greater Ani nest. Um, and they're pretty common there. Um, they're really abundant in central Panama. Wherever Anis occur, they occur in large numbers, especially greater Anis. Um, and what you can see from this map is that they like to put their nests on the shoreline um, of the island um, right at the edge of the water. Um, and these are other mainland peninsulas that are also part of the same nature reserve protected by the Smithsonian. And so this is what the habitat looks like. Um, they nest along the shores of lowland forest. And because the forests are so difficult to get through and because the birds put their nests as close to the water as possible, you can really only access them by boat. Um, we take small motor boats around the shores of the island and the peninsulas to try to find nests. Um, and many of the nests are built like this one. I don't know if you guys can see this. I'm trying to circle it with my pointer. I hope you can see what I'm pointing at. Um, this nest is built just a few feet above the water in the branch of a big ficus tree that's hanging out over the water's edge. Um, and this is like the dream for an ornithologist, right? You don't have to hire tree climbers to go up to the nests like you do with swallow-tailed kites. You can just stand up in the boat and reach in. Um, they also like to nest in um, swampy vegetation, um, little trees that are completely surrounded by water. These are pond apples. Um, they like to nest in these bromeliads where um, the nests are basically protected from predators, which is something I'll talk about in a little bit. A nest like this, monkeys and snakes can't get to the nest unless they swim there. And so the Anis really like those spots. Um, and they also like to nest on these tiny little bushes. The smaller, the better. If they can find just a stump that's got a couple leaves on it, that's their like preferred nesting site. Um, and so uh, what we do in these groups is we go around with our boats and we find nests at the beginning of the breeding season. And we try to track each egg as it's laid. We try to keep track of what happens to every single egg. And we use a technique that I developed when I was a grad student um, where we take a Q-tip and we rub the Q-tip over the surface of the egg and get genetic material. It's usually leftover blood um, from the female um, who laid that egg. You can see there's a blood stain on this egg here. And we can extract DNA from that blood smear and genotype the egg to tell which egg was laid by which female in the group, which is pretty important because they all look alike. And so there's no other way to tell which female is actually reproducing and how many um, eggs or nestlings each bird is producing in these groups. Um, and we also misnet birds and we give them color bands so we can recognize the adults. And we use nest cameras a lot to, to try to give us insights into behaviors that we can't observe in person um, things like the, the late nesting period here where these fledglings would normally be out of the nest right away if, if a human observer were there. But with a camera, we can see a lot more of their behaviors than we'd be able to see um, just, with, just with students sitting in boats all day. So um, working in boats and doing all the field work in small motorboats has its advantages, but it also has its disadvantages. So I wanted to show you guys some photos from our field site. Um, these are a few people who've been working in Panama for several years. This is my lab manager, Megan, on the left, Megan Strong, um, graduate student Maria Smith, and my undergrad student, Zach Smart, on the right. And they're holding a baby Ani. This Ani is actually really mobile. Um, and this is a bird that jumped out of the nest and was swimming in the water before they jumped overboard and, and got it. Um, so all the, all the work has to be done from a boat. You have to bring everything in the boat that you need for the day. We take blood samples from the boat. We band birds. Um, pretty much the whole day is spent in these little open boats. Um, this is my grad student, Amanda Savagin, who um, did her work on um, vocal behavior in Greater Anis, those communal calling displays I told you about. And so she's taking notes and recording birds with a headphone and, and, and um, a headset and microphone in the boat. Um, and it's a really cool study area because on the one side, you'll see beautiful forests like this. Uh, it's a flowering dipteryx tree. Um, and then if you look on your other side, you'll see the Panama Canal with container ships going through the canal. And our field site is on the island as well as the perimeters of the mainland peninsula. So we frequently go back and forth across the canal in our boats. We just wait for the container ships to pass and then we try to go across the canal really fast before another one comes. 
The biggest challenge of working with these birds is that it is no fun to put up mist nets in the water. Um, and it's really hard to catch them. So greater onis um, bounce out of mist nets really easily. They have these long tails and they don't fly very fast. And so um, for those of you who've done mist netting, any problem you've ever had putting up or taking down a mist net, multiply it by 100 and you have an idea of what it's like to put up mist nets in boats. It's very common for a container ship to go by and then the waves just push your boat right into the mist net <laughs> as, as you're trying to take, take a bird in or out of the net. Um, and so what we do is we, we actually put up these nets in the water along the shore to trap the onis as they're going to and from roost sites. Um, and we have to use these guy wires to keep the, the nets upright. Um, this is Amanda in a canoe having just successfully tied up a mist net for the night. Um, and so the, one of the main problems with doing mist nets from boats is that you can't really stand up in a canoe. So just uh, next time you have to take a bird out of, out of a mist net, just be glad you're doing it on firm land. But the reward is that if you put up enough of these nets, eventually you catch onis. And this is a postdoc in my lab, Joshua Pergola, um, getting bitten by an ani, which is a, a great reward. We would all love to be bitten by onis on days when we're trying to trap onis. So for the past... 15 plus years, um, every summer we've gone to Panama and we've found nests and we use Sharpies and write a number on each egg as it's laid so we can keep track of it. We take blood samples and genetic samples from each egg and we band the nestlings and we take blood samples from the nestlings. And what we're trying to do with all this nest monitoring and all this information, these hundreds of nests and thousands of eggs that we've tracked over the years is really understand why birds are nesting in these groups and what the costs and benefits are to this peculiar form of social life. And to understand, for example, why are birds acting as helpers? What do they get out of it in the end? Um, what are the costs and benefits of nesting in a large group versus a small group? And particularly, why are they nesting in groups at all? Because of all the species of onis, greater onis are the only ones that never nest as lone pairs. They always nest as groups. Um, and so I'm just gonna spend the rest of the talk telling you about a few of the uh, main results from our work over the past several years. Um, we've got lots of different projects ongoing that I'll be happy to talk about later, but I just kind of wanted to give you the highlights for this talk. Um, and one of the main highlights is just how important predation is to Anis and how much it drives this social system. So this is a photograph that I took uh, like maybe 14 years ago or so. When I, I went to an ani nest and I, I stood up in the boat to check it and I looked in and there is a young uh, bird snake. This is Sustis um, postilionotus with its jaws wrapped around an ani egg. This is like one of the first times I had ever seen a snake eat a bird egg. And since then, I found these snakes and seen these snakes in more videos than I can remember, than I can even count. Um, this, this species, the bird snake, is probably the most important predator of tropical bird nests, not just onis, but tropical bird nests full stop, at least in the lowland tropics. Um, about 50% of all the eggs laid over the course of the study period have been eaten by this species of snake. Um, I have a nice videos of this, but because Zoom doesn't play very well with videos, I thought I'd just show you a series of screenshots from a video. This is what happens to most ani eggs. So here is a nest with an egg in it. And the reason there's only one egg in this nest is that all the rest of the eggs have already been eaten by the snake. Um, but nevertheless, a female laid an egg and it, it laid the egg in the morning and this is late afternoon, it's almost dusk. And um, over the course of filming this nest, we saw a bird snake come to the, the nest and eat the egg. So this is, you can barely see it here. This is the snake in the nest, here's its head. It's got sort of a salmon colored belly and a black, um, a black back. Um, and it comes to the nest. Now you can see the snake's head is over the egg. It engulfs the egg in its jaws. Here it is. There's the egg vanishing and there goes the snake now with this egg-shaped bulge right behind its head. So that's what happens to most ani eggs. Um, and one of the things that anis can do to protect themselves from having their eggs be eaten by snakes is they can mob the snakes. And the more birds in the group that participate in mobbing, the more birds that are there, the better chance they have of actually being able to deter a snake from the nest. Um, 
they have more eyes at the nest to be able to see it earlier. And we've gotten a lot of nest videos where a snake actually comes into the, the nest video. You can see it off to the side and you hear the birds mobbing it and you hear the birds getting upset and the snake never actually makes it to the nest. So one of the cool things we've able, been able to see on these videos is unsuccessful attempts at predation. Times when snakes have actually found the nest and would have eaten the eggs, except that the adults drove the snakes away. Um, oh, there goes the snake. Um, egg, egg in hand. Um, so we get a lot of videos like this where you see mobbing behavior and then you see the snake leave. Um, and that's pretty cool because it means that these birds are actually able to deter snakes. Um, and uh, that, oh, this is another, um, this is just another funny one. This is a group of Ani sitting on their nest. Um, this is another still shot from a, a video. These birds are sitting on their nest calling together and what they've just successfully done is drive away a different predator from the nest. In this case, it was a purple gallinule, which bet you didn't know purple gallinules ate Ani eggs, but they do. Um, and so um, I don't have a ton of data slides in this talk, but I thought this one was impressive enough to share, which is that there's a really strong relationship between the number of birds in a nesting group and the odds that the nest will get eaten by, that the, the eggs will all get eaten by a predator. Um, and so with each additional bird that you add to the group, a group of four versus five versus six, um, each additional bird decreases the chances of the eggs getting found and eaten by a predator by about 15%, which is about the one of the strongest effects that's ever been observed for a communal breeder or any sort of cooperative breeding bird. It's a really strong advantage. Um, and it's a good thing it is a strong advantage because there are also real costs to breeding in a group. Um, I mentioned at the beginning that communal nesting is really rare in birds because you have this inevitable competition between not only the adults that are essentially sharing space within the same nest, but also the nestlings that are sharing resources brought by the adults. Um, and in greater onis, um, and in fact, all of the onis, same, the smooth build and group build onis do exactly the same thing. This competition takes a very stereotyped and repeatable form at the beginning of the laying period. So in Ani nests, inevitably one female in an Ani group has to be the first one to start laying eggs. There's no way for the Anis to synchronize their reproduction so perfectly that both females or all three females lay their eggs at exactly the same time. Someone has to go first. And in Ani groups, the other females who haven't laid yet will always push that first laid egg out of the nest. Um, this is another one I have really great videos, but I'll just show you a series of still photos. This is another um, sequence of photos showing an egg meeting its demise, but in this case, um, it's an Ani in, this, in the breeding group, actually a group member who's gonna destroy this egg. So what this is showing is an Ani nest. Egg number one has been laid in the nest by a female, um, but it wasn't by this female. This is a different female. This is not the one that laid this egg. And so when she comes to the nest and sees that the first egg has been laid, but it's not hers, she'll reach down in the nest, pull the egg with her bill. She's pulled it in this case, she's pulled it up to the rim of the nest. And then she'll use her bill to push it over the side of the nest. Um, as you can see, this nest is built over water. So this egg will just go beneath the surface of the water and never be heard from again. Um, and this happens 100% of the time in greater Ani nests, in groove built Ani nests, in smooth built Ani nests because those early laid eggs are always destroyed by females that haven't started laying yet. And this sounds like a very difficult way to make a communal group function, but what happens is that once that first female has laid, then the other females start laying too. And once a female has laid an egg, she doesn't destroy eggs anymore. So once all of the females in the group have laid at least one egg, they stop pushing eggs out of the nest and they start caring for the eggs. Um, and so what this produces is a pattern like this. This is basically just a schematic showing that. Um, female A here has laid her own first egg. And at this point, female B hasn't laid yet. So female B will push that egg out of the nest. It gets a big red X through it. But then once female B starts laying, then A and B are both laying and neither of them will destroy eggs anymore. And so the clutch can accumulate. Um, and that happens in every Ani nest with variations. So sometimes female A lay, might lay two eggs before female B starts laying. Sometimes she might lay a lot of eggs before female B starts laying. But the more synchronized the females are, um, the better, because in the most, in the ideal situation, female A might only lose one egg before female B starts laying. 
The problem, of course, is that if you have a group with three females or four females, then it gets even more complicated because then female A and B and C all have to start laying before the eggs can accumulate in the nest. So, um, so this problem just becomes exacerbated in larger groups. Um, this is a kind of cool note from smooth-billed onis. Smooth-billed onis sometimes push each other's eggs out of the nest the way that greater onis do, but sometimes they just keep building. They just keep putting nest material on top of the eggs and they kill them that way. So they just keep building on top of their group members' eggs and they bury them in the, the structure of the nest. Um, and this was an egg that was uh, a nest, that, a smooth-billed onis nest that was taken apart by my colleague Jim Quinn in Puerto Rico. And he counted um, eight eggs at the top of the clutch. So eight eggs that were like actually being incubated. And then in the nest lining, there were 41 other eggs that had been laid by females in the group that had just been buried before all of the females had started to lay. Um, they also do some egg ejection as well. So in this case, a few eggs had also been pushed out of the nest. Um, so as I said, um, the, the number of eggs that pushed out of the nest goes up with group size because it's, it's even harder to synchronize three laying females or four laying females. And this is almost certainly why we very rarely see um, nests with four or five laying females in them. It's usually just two or three. Um, and you might think like there's a, that's a big cost to, to being the first layer. But um, one of the things we've seen in these honey groups is that the identity of the first laying female changes over time. So in the same group, one female might be female A in this nesting attempt, but the next time that group lays a clutch, it's a different female that goes first. And so those costs do tend to equalize over time among females. So early in my PhD, I found this great result, which was that the benefits of communal nest defense and deterring predators far outweighed the costs of egg ejection, such that being in a larger group meant that each female in that group fledged more young than females did in smaller groups. And I thought, this is great. This shows why Ani's nest in groups. Um, but it turns out it's actually way more complicated than that. And it makes sense that it's more complicated that, than that. It's not just that large groups are better. Um, because as I said before, only about 30% of Ani groups actually contain three pairs. So there's got to be some reason that most of the birds in this area are actually nesting in small groups. If large groups seem to have higher reproductive output. And the reason for that, the, the complicating thing that I didn't know when I started this project is that um, these were data from just the first few years of the project and not all years are equal, um, especially in tropical areas, El Nino's um, and just natural variation in rainfall causes huge changes in resources and food availability from year to year. Um, this was Barrow, Colorado Island in 2015, and you no longer see that nice smooth surface of the water. Instead, what you see are all these stumps that were exposed from when the Panama Canal was flooded 100 years ago um, because the water level fell so much um, in the El Nino drought. Um, and drought years are really tough on Anis. There's not enough food to go around. And large clutches suffer more than small clutches, especially clutches with lots of babies. Um, this is data on the reproductive output of birds in three pair groups in red, large groups, versus small, small groups, two pair groups in blue. And what you can see is it doesn't look the same over years. This is all the way from 2006 to 2017. Um, and in dry years, in El Nino years, the three pair groups, the large groups actually do quite a bit worse than the small groups do. Um, so in wet years, like in 2010 and again in 2017, the large groups do better. So what this means is that different sizes of groups actually have, an, have the advantage in different years. And I think probably what's going on is that um, I mentioned competition among females before with egg ejection, but another form of competition is competition among the nestlings for food. Um, in dry years, large clutches with a lot of eggs really suffer. Um, having all those extra chicks reduces the chance of all of the young surviving. There's a lot more starvation in these large clutches in dry years. Um, and so I think what's happening is that the benefits of communal nesting, the anti-predator benefits are the same in every year, but the costs of competition for food change a lot from year to year. And so that creates this situation where there's no ideal group size. Some years it's better to be in a small group and some years it's better to be in a large group. 
Um, and so you might think that um, one solution to that might be for groups to change over years, right? If, you're, if it's a dry year, join a small group. If it's a wet year, join a large group. But the Anis don't do that. In fact, their groups are incredibly stable over time. Um, this photograph was taken in 2017 um, by one of my undergrads. And this bird is banded. This one is too, you just can't see the bands. Uh, this pair has been nesting in the same tree since 2007. So they can stay with their same group members for at least 10 years, probably more. Um, and some of these groups stay not just with the same, same social pairs, but with the same co-breeding pairs for that length of time as well. Um, on average, each bird stays in a breeding group for about four and a half years, but that average obscures a, a great range. Some are in a group for just one year, and then once they get in a group on a really good nesting territory where they're successful, they might stay for the rest of their lives. Um, and we think these birds live to be about 15 or 20. So there's really strong group stability, um, which means that they don't just move from group to group in a given year, depending on the resources. They, they prefer to stay with their, with their group members. Um, there are a lot of advantages to this. One is that females who have already nested together synchronize their laying more tightly, which is important in terms of the egg ejection that I talked about earlier. That high synchrony means that fewer eggs are lost to ejection. Um, and another benefit of it is that groups that have nested in the same place are much better at holding on to that place and fending off competition from other Ani groups. So I mentioned the importance of predators. What I didn't mention was that Ani groups also compete with each other for these territories. Um, we discovered this kind of by accident. Um, in 2019, I had an undergrad do a project where I said, okay, put out a bunch of fake Ani nests, build some fake nests, put out some fake eggs, let's put cameras on all these and let's see what predators come to them. Let's like really do this predator thing in a controlled way. So we thought we'd see monkeys and snakes coming to find the nests, but instead what we found were Ani's coming to the nests and destroying them. This is a fake nest um, with three eggs. You can actually see that this egg is tied into the nest. Uh, it's a, a clay egg. And sometimes within hours, other Anis would find these groups, find these nests that look like Ani nests, and they would do the same thing to these nests as they do to each other. They would eject the eggs from the nest. They really destroyed these eggs. Um, and they do this to other groups too when they try to nest too close by. They just, they just absolutely destroy their nests. They're really vicious about it. Um, this is another um, image of a different nest, a different fake nest and an Ani attacking it. Of all the fake nests she put out, we only had pre real predators come to two of them. And one was a capuchin. This is a capuchin monkey who's grabbed this fake egg and is looking really, really dubious about it. Um, and so the last thing I'll talk about, I know it's nine, so we're running out of time. Um, but the last thing I'll talk about is the, the sneakiest of all reproductive strategies the Anis have, which is to act as parasites on other groups. Um, so I mentioned at the beginning that sometimes females lay eggs in other groups' nests and they don't provide parental care and they don't participate in the social bonds and the rest of these group activities. Um, and this was something that we had seen in the field, like we thought we saw females trying to get into these other nests and the group members really don't like it. They mostly try to um, repel the, uh, um, extra group birds from their nests. They don't like strangers approaching their nests. But when you genotype the eggs, um, and when you look at the patterns of egg laying, sometimes you can see that there are different females laying in these nests who are not group members. Um, it's only a very small percentage of eggs though, it's pretty rare. Um, and uh, back when I was doing my PhD work, um, I learned that one of the things that Anis can do to protect themselves against being parasitized is to use the appearance of the egg to look at the timing of egg laying. So as I said before, Anis can't recognize their own eggs, but they can recognize when an egg was laid. And the way they do this is by using patterns of wear on the shell. Um, Anis actually lay blue eggs that are coated in this white chalky stuff. It's called batterite and it's a polymorph of calcium carbonate. It's basically like chalk. And this white stuff can be scraped off with your fingernails, it can be scratched off. And a freshly laid egg is pure white, maybe with a couple nicks in it. And then after the egg is incubated, this chalky stuff wears off and the egg starts to look blue. And you can really see the color change. So I always use this to, to tell when, how old a nest was, to tell whether the eggs in a nest were fresh or whether they had been incubated for a few days. Um, and we could see that the Anis were using this cue as well. 
Um, because when you look at a nest that's mostly eggs that have been incubated, mostly blue eggs, and a fresh white egg appears in the nest that was laid by a female who wasn't in sequence with the other females, one who didn't lay eggs at the same time, it's really obvious. That's what this looks like. This is a naturally parasitized nest with a bunch of old blue eggs and a freshly laid white egg standing out like a sore thumb. Um, and so the Anis can actually push those eggs out of the nest when they look different, um, even though they don't know who laid that egg. They'll even push out their own eggs if they look different. And I showed that through experiments and through manipulations of the nests. So as a result, the parasitic eggs hardly ever hatch. They're usually timed wrong compared to the rest of the host eggs. And when they do manage to lay an egg in a nest, um, the host group often ejects it from the nest. Um, and so one of the things we've been working on for the past several years is understanding why females do this. If the success rates are so low, who are these females acting as parasites and why are they parasitizing? Um, and what we used to answer this question was the information on the genetics that we had built up over years of who all these females were and which groups they had been part of in previous years and when they acted as parasites. Um, and what we found is that most of these parasitic eggs are laid by females who were actually part of a social group, but whose nest was destroyed by predators, like a nest that was found by a snake while they were still laying. And so sometimes those females will um, just stop laying and wait until next year. That's what most of them do. But sometimes those females will go to a neighboring nest and they'll just lay an egg in a neighboring nest. It's sort of a, a last ditch strategy to try, to try to reproduce if their own nest has been destroyed. Um, so those are a couple of stories from Aniland. And um, I think one of the things I've uh, really grown to appreciate about these birds is that they're, they're in it for a long game. You know, these birds are pretty long lived. Um, they're not migratory. They're staying on their territories year round. They develop these long relationships with their other group members. Uh, and even with birds in neighboring groups, they, they parasitize them, they destroy each other's nests. They're really aware of what's going on in all of the neighboring territories. Um, and so uh, one of the things we're working on now is understanding how, how individuals move between groups across years and what happens when uh, a bird that has previously acted as a parasite joins a group, potentially as a group member, which is also something we're, we're starting to see. Um, so with that, um, I'd be happy to take questions if anyone is still awake. Um, and I'd really like to thank um, Orleans Audubon and in particular Tom and Jen because working with them in high school and in college, um, it was the best education I could have had. It gave me these skills and these tools that I was able to use in grad school right away to start developing this project. And none of this would have happened without their help and all their advice over the years. So um, yeah, I'm just so grateful to have been part of this community and uh, to, have, to have grown up in this very special place with this very special burning, birding society. Um, so thanks. <laughs>